Give God 90, where we're not afraid of the tough biblical questions, because we will dig through the language, the culture, and the history to find the truth revealed in the words of our Creator. Hello, everyone. Thank you for sharing part of your day with us. We really appreciate it. My name is Jerry Mitchell, your host for Give God 90. Sitting in here attempting to supervise me is Myra. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, it, it's it been a fun week. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> interesting, maybe. <laughs> okay, interesting. It, it, we're, we're getting ready to move uh, here in a couple of weeks, and as we're packing and, and doing different things, you know, you run across things, you, you and... and you always wonder, you know, am I going to need this right away? Am I going to need that right away? Oh, how, I'll, I'm going to admit something here. I lost a battle with the boxes a while ago because I could not find a box for the things that I wanted to put in it that was the perfect size. You know, and, and I hunted through the bo- pile of boxes that we have, and I finally gave up and said, you know what, I will deal with this later because right now is not the time <laughs> so it, it's been it's been fun it's been fun but it's all good uh, <laughs> um, if you're thinking about getting one of the books it doesn't matter which one it is there's three of them out there now go ahead and do that order early if you're giving them uh, for gifts you know the the, the whatever holiday you're celebrating you know it's always a good time to give a book there's my advertisement for the day (laughs) (laughs) if you like the things you hear that we do you know don't be afraid of those like buttons uh share a lot do yourself and everybody else a favor subscribe hit the notifications all the good stuff whatever uh podcast platform you're listening to it just helps everybody else find it um, the comments, I, I get lots of comments. <laughs> I, I had lots of comments from what I said on Monday. <laughs> uh, some people wanted to know who I was mad at. I wasn't mad at anyone, uh, but it is frustrating when you have the information that is so available to us today and people get stuck in their denominational doctrines, their traditions. And it, it's frustrating that when you show them what's there in the language, what's there you know, in the Bible, you don't have to go outside of the Bible to find it, and they still reject it, that's frustrating. You know, it, it's their choice to believe it or reject it. You know, don't, and I'm going to give you this warning, don't reject the Bible, don't reject Scripture or parts of it, because if you do, you're going to reject the whole thing, right? Now, we need to verify it sometimes, make sure what it says, but to flat out reject it, um, that will be their problem. They, they, they're the ones that have to work that out in fear and trembling, okay? Uh, but for tonight, not for the weak of heart. It might not be what you think it is, because we're going to cover a lot of ground. And I want to begin with a a quote from someone I met uh, a very long time ago, uh, somebody that I came to admire quite a bit. Now, this this person was not famous, not at all, other than among his own family and friends. Um, He was just a plain old dairy farmer uh, a long, long time ago. And uh, he died several, well, 
I guess I can say many years ago now. But when he was around uh, his mid to late 60s, he wrote something that I often think about. Um, and I'm going to quote him. He writes this, uh, very interestingly enough, as the introduction uh, for one of his presentations. And I'm going to quote him now. The ungodliness in the world today, civil unrest, decline in more value, moral values, and broken family homes are disturbing factors in the 1970s. Now, for someone who, is, who was born just after the turn of the 20th century to write this, can we imagine what he had lived through uh, that would give him this outlook in his 60-plus years of living? <laughs> Think about the things he he had seen, right? <laughs> now, let's think about what the children of today consider normal in whatever society uh, they might live in. It, it doesn't matter whether it's in the United States or or Russia or Ukraine. It doesn't matter what society you live in, what country you live in, what culture you're from. Think about what children of today consider normal. But let's remember something as we, as we think about that. Remember that divorce in most cultures is normal today, but it wasn't in 1970. Open homosexuality is considered normal today in most cultures, but not in 1970. Slavery for sexual pleasure is considered normal by some today, but it certainly wasn't in 1970. They had these things, but it was not, you know, considered normal. Only, uh, what, 52 years ago in 1970, children were actually being taught, and I know this because I was there, people were actually being taught in school that we should embrace diversity. We should treat everyone as equal. didn't matter if they were male, female, black, white, Asian, didn't matter. They could, they could be a purple Martian. And you were still supposed to treat them equally as, you know, just somebody, not something. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Today, though, it's different. Today, you know, in the United States, children are taught in school that if you're white, you're bad. Automatically. Doesn't matter where you're from, who you are. Today, children are taught that if you're not aware of your, uh, and I'm with air quote gender, okay, they they misuse that word. It's you know if you're not aware of your sex at a young age, your parents must be homophobic. They must be racist. It doesn't matter what color they are, they must be racist. You know, from my point of view, and I'm <laughs> speaking as somebody who's made almost sixty trips around the sun now coming up on it anyway. I will say this. Mankind today is far more self-absorbed than ever before in history. We don't care about anybody other than ourselves. You know, today, think about this. If I'm white, if I'm born white, I'm bad. If I'm born black, I'm underprivileged. If I'm born male, I should be female. If I was born female, I have to be underpaid. I must be underpaid. If I, if I, if I. Some people think I'm privileged, and I, I am. I'm privileged to happen to know a lot of people. Some are white, some are black, some are homosexual, some are believers, some consider themselves atheists, some are liberal, some are conservative. <laughs> some live in the United States, some live in other countries, but they all have the they all have the same thing in common today though. It doesn't matter where we live, where we're from, everybody today has the same thing in common. They're dissatisfied with their society. Everybody wants their society. Everybody wants the place they live to be better. But the really strange thing is 
is that even among the people I know personally, it doesn't matter what group they might consider themselves to be associated with, there are conflicts within those groups. There's conflicts within the black community, within the white community, within the homosexual community, within the conservative groups, within the liberal groups. There's even <laughs> oh, there's even dissatisfaction among the believers. You know, wouldn't it be nice to go back to where it was Acts chapter two and say they were all in one accord, they were all thinking the same thing, they all understood what their responsibilities were? Now, I don't do what I'm about to do often, <clears throat> so I need to let our Jewish listeners know that Meyer's going to be reading from the New Testament, but I, I hope that doesn't scare you off, because this, um, well, you just might be surprised where it leads, okay? I'll say that. And uh, I hope our Jewish listeners are still listening, because at the end of this, Paul writes something extremely important that most modern Christians overlook. I'm not going to harp on it. I'm just going to mention it, though. Um, this is extremely valuable for the times we are living in today. So go ahead and read through that, if you would. But understand this. In the last days, terrible times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, without love of good, traitorous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Turn away from such as these. They are the kind of who warm their way into households and captivate valuable women who are weighed down with sin and vulnerable let... women. What? Vulnerable women. They uh, captivate vulnerable women. Sorry. Who vulnerable. are also valuable, but they're all, they're vulnerable, vulnerable at that point. Who are weighted down <clears throat> with sins and led astray by various passions who are always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth, just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these men oppose the truth. They are deprived in mind and disqualified from the faith, but they will not advance much further, for just like Janus and Jambres, their folly will be the will be plain to everyone. You, however, have observed my teachings, my conduct, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my perseverance, my persecutions, and the sufferings that came upon me in Antioch, Iconum, and Lystra. What persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. Indeed, all you... All who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil men and impostors go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in the things you have learned and firmly believed, since you know from whom you have learned them. From infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for instruction, for conviction, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, fully equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-17 through 17. Yeah. Does that sound like today? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, now, the reference to uh, Jonas and Jambres are actually from the book of Jasher. Uh, some call that the book of the upright. But, uh, you know, that's not where I'm going with this. Okay. You know, what, what Myra just read describes a society 
whose members primarily, the majority of them, are self-absorbed. You know, it, it's all about me. The world revolves around me. Hey, look at me. I'm white and I'm bad. I'm black. I'm underprivileged. I'm homosexual and I deserve to be treated better than anybody else. I'm female and I'm underpaid. Hmm. Think about some of the other people we hear. You know, I live in a poor country. Give me. I live in poverty. I deserve the latest and greatest phone and free internet, and I shouldn't have to pay for it. I want. I want. I want. Maybe instead of I want, we should change that. Maybe we should start saying I will. I will. I will. I will live better. I will love better. I will love more. And I will help others be better people. You know, we know someone who lives in a very poor country. And he works very hard every day to help the people around him improve their lives. And I've reached out to various organizations uh, that claim they want to help communities like his. And their response is, uh, is, well, they don't qualify for our assistance. Or we're, we're just understaffed right now, and, and it's going to be a very long time before we can get to them. But you, you know, feel free to keep donating to us. You know, and some of these uh, organizations, we've actually spoken with representatives of in the past uh, who had been fundraising for them, and, and they made it sound really, really, really good. But they like to pick and choose the very, very few places they go to help. And, and they tend to keep these places underprivileged so that they can keep showing you pictures and keep the donations rolling in. And I've talked about that a lot before, right? Be careful who you give to. Do your homework. We know there are people in the world who are trying to help, truly trying to help. And we know there are people in the world who only want to help themselves. We can identify the problem, but when the solution is put in front of us, are you willing to utilize the solution? Are you willing to take the solution and apply it properly? In the passage Meyer read, Paul writes that all Scripture is God-breathed and it's useful for instruction, conviction, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Christians, I'm going to address this to you right now. Do you understand that when Paul wrote this, the New Testament was being written? It had not been compiled it had not been canonized. So what scripture is Paul referring to? Most scholars actually have been able to say that the, the letters that Paul wrote were written before the Gospels. And the Gospels were written in response to some of the things that Paul had been writing. Now, Paul says that all scripture is is God breathed it's valuable what was he referring to he's writing that the you know the old testament right that thing that most christians today claim is no longer valid we don't have to do anything we don't have to do those things anymore that was for those people back then oh that's been done away with that's been nailed to the cross that's what Paul was writing about. So if, if you're rejecting it, you might want to reconsider what you are rejecting. You know, I, I said people consider me privileged, and I am I'm privileged to be working with some people in some of the poorest countries in the world, living in the poorest communities. <coughs> Excuse me. And I, I can tell you that these people have heard the gospel 
but they have never been taught the faith that was once delivered to the saints. That's missing from their lives. Many of these places have been told, oh, if you just believe in Jesus, all your problems will go away. But their problems get worse. They've been told that, oh, if you pray and believe, your trouble will be over. Well, they've got a lot of trouble. Uh, Two weeks ago, a young girl was raped in a village. Um, She was traveling to get water. And she was killed. This past week, a 12-year-old child died, most likely from uh, bacteria in the dirty water that they have to drink. I speak with people who have neighbors who are hungry almost every day because their farming practices are just not adequate to supply the needs of the people. It's happening now, this week in the 21st century. And sadly, a lot of Christians, a lot of believers are throwing good money after bad because it's easy just to write a check. It's easy just to send you know, a couple of dollars. It's like raking leaves into a hole in your yard. It doesn't fill up the hole, it only covers it up, and it actually creates a trap for others to fall into. Now, don't get me wrong here. This is not a plea for you to donate your dollars to some worthy cause. That's not what I'm thinking. That's not what I'm getting at. And don't think for don't think for a second at all that, you know, if well if I go uh serve, you know, mashed potatoes to the homeless at the soup kitchen on Thanksgiving, I'm going to make a difference in somebody's lives. You're not. That doesn't make a bit of difference. Oh, it makes a difference to you. Makes you feel better. I did something to give back to my community. Did you? Really? You realize if you hadn't been there, somebody else would have been. Thinking the same thing. Don't fall for that television, entertainment, good feeling that if you give to some obscure charity, you're helping. You're not helping. You're, you're only making the problem worse. You're, you're, you're raking leaves into a deep hole for somebody else to fall into. Hopefully, you actually did want to help. You weren't doing that just to make yourself feel good. You know, hopefully, you know, you're not so self self absorbed that you know, you might think, well, if I give a couple of dollars to this group, you know, and I'll get that free calendar, I'll get the, the you know, the free donation gift. I I'm a good person. No, you're not. No, you're not. If you want to be a good person, if you really, truly want to be a good person, use the skills that the Almighty spoke into you when he created you into existence. Use those skills to help someone else. If you want to be a good person, reach out to somebody who's close to you and offer the help they need, which is probably going to be different than the help they want. You know, when I speak on the phone with people in poor countries or I deliver a message to people in places where they are being persecuted for their beliefs, I give them the same message, tell them the same, pretty much the same thing. It might be in a different way, but I tell them pretty much the same thing. When you live the way the Creator designed you to live and you practice the faith that was once delivered to the saints, your life will change. That's the Almighty's promise, not mine. Okay? That's His promise, not mine. When you practice that faith that was once delivered to the saints, when you love God with all your heart and everything you've got, and you love the people around you as much or more than you love yourself, your life has to improve. doesn't have a choice. Now, you might not 
you know, you may not have the latest of what iPhone 14 or whatever they're up to now. You might not have a lot of money in the bank, but your life will improve. Now, you're still going to have the scars. You're still going to have the pain. You're, you're still going to have the garbage from your past that wants to haunt you. But the reality is those things remind us of why we choose to change, why we choose to not live that self-absorbed, self-destructive lifestyle. Our Creator isn't offering you some magical quick fix. Okay, that's not the way it works. He doesn't, he, he doesn't hear your prayer and snap his fingers and everything's all better. You know, the mixed multitude actually had to get up and walk out of Egypt. They had to put one foot in front of the other and, and travel. They had to leave where they were to get to where they wanted to be. Well, let me say that another way. They had to leave where they were under their own power, under the Almighty's protection, but under their own power, to go to where the Almighty was guiding them. Somebody just said, uh-oh, I can hear it. I could hear it. You mean I have to do something? I, I don't just pray and get what I want? Hmm. Here's a radical thought. Something that you don't hear a lot of lately. And, and thankfully, I don't spend a lot of time listening to all the TV preachers, all the evangelists. Our Creator created us. We are here to worship and serve Him. He did not create us so that He could serve us. You know, he's not our fairy godmother. He's God. Plain and simple. And this is exactly what Paul is warning Timothy about. People will love themselves so much, they will want God to be nothing more than their servant. He tells Timothy that the people who practice the faith, the people who live the way they're designed to live, will face persecution of some type. You, you, know, you might just get laughed at. You might just get looked at funny. You might be threatened. You might get killed. Depends on where you live. The people who are not self-absorbed, selfish, arrogant, egotistical morons are now considered a threat to society. While the people who only care for themselves are considered normal. That's the world we live in today. Each generation since creation falls farther and farther into sin. But the choice not to participate in sin is yours. The choice not to do evil is your choice to make. The choice to make a difference is your choice. It's up to you. The choice to say... I want or I will is also up to you. The choice to practice the faith once delivered, that's a choice only you can make. Now, the faith that was once delivered is described in the first five books of the Bible. You don't have to worry about the uh, sacrificing stuff, most of it. Okay? That's been taken care of. But the application, how you take those, those instructions that we have in the first five books of Moses and how you apply that to your life, those examples are given to us in the prophets and the other books of the Old Testament. 
And one of the things we try to do here, when I'm not off on some tangent, <laughs> is to teach you how to apply those things to your life. Now, it's not a one-size-fits-all. You are free to take those examples. You are free to look at that and say, well, I can make this work and I can make that work. And, oh, if I do that, things will change. You, you know, that's where the freedom comes, okay? So I'm going to challenge you now to strengthen your heart and make that choice. Do the things that, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to make this really simple. <laughs> I don't do that often. Live like you're here to worship and serve God. Don't live like God is here to worship and serve you. I think I have probably said enough for today. <laughs> so, until Monday, um, practice those things. See what changes in your life, even in that short amount of time. And, and I should probably... Um, give you this warning for the next couple of weeks because we're going to be traveling and doing some other things getting you know taking care of this move um we may or may not be live but i will try to put something out even if we have to record it and then upload it differently but we'll try to get something out and um when we get on the other end maybe we can go back to our regular schedule again <laughs> But until Monday, we offer you many, many blessings, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.